and then staying for our fundraising panel, I'm going to drop in the chat a publicly shared agenda that has a ton of resources um, that we'll be walking through with our fundraising panel today. We have four amazing leaders joining us um, from teams all across the country to talk a little bit about successful fundraisers that they ran in 2021. So I'm super excited to um, be leading this panel with our four amazing leaders. We have Lisa Rosenthal from Sister District Peninsula, CA Peninsula, John McConnell from Sister District Portland, Kelly Wilkerson from Sister District CA3, and Jim Harper from Sister District Greater Chicago. How this will work is each of them um, will give five minute presentations on fundraising tactics that worked really well for their teams in the 2021 cycle. And then we'll have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So if you have questions, be sure to hold those till the end. Um, and then you can hear from, you can ask your questions of our great fundraising panelists. I'm super excited. And with that, I am gonna kick it right over to Lisa, um, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about CA Peninsula's strategy for running fundraising throughout the whole year. And I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you, Lisa. Can you unmute Lisa or no? Okay, let me make sure. Now I can. There you go, okay. <laughs> Greetings, hi everybody. Lisa Rosenthal from uh, Sister District CA Peninsula where the chapter uh, just south of San Francisco on the San Francisco Peninsula. And we have a dynamite chapter. I'm very proud to be co-captain of. We have a leadership team of 17. We have a mailing list of 1600, over 1,600. Um, we were organized shortly after um, Trump got elected and Sister District came into being. So we've been at this for five years and we are like a machine right now. But I'm gonna give you some strategies that any chapter can use. Um, we have, uh, we have three main strategies for fundraising. We do matching donations, we do monthly fundraisers, and we do monthly meetings. And I'm going to talk about each one of those. Um, so right now at the beginning of the year, in January and February, we are reaching out to people for matching donations. We start out with our leadership team. The first meeting of the year, we ask our leadership team each to kick in um, $100 or more to provide the very first matching donation for our first fundraiser that we had um, in January. And we were able to uh, take some of that money, $1,000 to be the first matching donation for um, our first fundraiser. We also um, took a look at all of the people who gave matching donations last year and we sent out, uh, we're, we haven't done it yet, but we have just composed um, a letter to all of those previous matching donors, uh, telling them where their money went, what, they, what we did with it, and asking them to re-engage. And if you look in the agenda, um, I've highlighted uh, that letter, so you can just use that as a template. Um, if you're interested. And then we will, um, I also created a template for all of our leadership team to send out to their networks to ask for new matching donations for this year. And that um, letter links to a Google form that people can just fill out. We don't ask for the, obviously for their donation right away. We ask for it when we need it as a match. And that helps us, that Google form helps us to keep track of all of the matching do donors that we get. Um, and it makes it pretty seamless. And all of those documents, um, as I mentioned, are in the agenda. Matching donations are just crucial. Um, they allow people who want to give to double their impact. And then they allow people at our events to also feel like their impact is going to be doubled by the matching donation. Um, then we have our monthly fundraisers. And I, we, like to, we like to say we put the fun in fundraisers. We really try to have um, many fundraisers that are just things that people wanna come to. And so shining example of that is the um, 
fundraiser that we're going, we're co-hosting with uh, Portland. I see Mary Ann um, from the Portland Plus chapter, uh, Stand Up for Democracy coming up on March 15th. It's a comedy night. Uh, who wouldn't want to come to something like that? We all need laughs, but it's an opportunity to get the message out and to raise money for Sister District. Uh, some of the other fun fundraisers that we have done, we did uh, uh, last July, we did a down ballot blues concert. Um, one of our uh, leadership members has a great deck in his backyard and is associated with a number of bands. And uh, we were able to have a band in the backyard and cocktails. And again, give that message out about uh, Sister District. And then we do have some, some serious um, fundraisers where we invite speakers on uh, political topics. We've invited our very own California um, uh, legis state legislators to come talk at our meetings, but we try to make those fun as well. So for example, we invited um, our, our state legislatures, state legislators, and the event was called uh, Daquiries, Dolmas, Kebabs, and Why States Are Critical for Democracy. So that was an, an in-person event that we were able to um, have in September. We, uh, we fed them with Mediterranean food. We had uh, daiquiris at the bar as well as other drinks. And uh, we had a great big ask at that event. The other thing about our events is every event, whether it's virtual or in person, has an entry fee. So for the virtual events, and we did a number of those during the pandemic, we asked for $35 to get in the door, $20 for those who are under 30. Um, but then there's always an ask at the event and the mention of a matching donor. And also we do what we do with the matching donations is if you can't come to the event, we say that that money from people who aren't able to come to the event will also be matched. Um, and then the last thing that we do is we have monthly meetings. They're always the second Thursday of the month at 7 p.m. Right now we're doing them virtually. We used to do them in person. We hope to be able to do them in person again, perhaps in the spring. Um, we have speakers on different topics at our upcoming meeting on March 10th. Um, we're going to have a speaker on redistricting um, a consultant who, who um, has worked with redistricting in California. And um, uh, those monthly meetings provide an opportunity. We don't ask for money at those, um, at those meetings, but it's a way to engage people, to introduce them to Sister District, to tell them about the fundraising and fun events that we're having, uh, to introduce them to our chapter. We think we're a fun group of people. We're it's, it's a great place to meet like-minded people and feel like you're doing something to save our democracy. And that's a great way to engage volunteers. So that's uh, it for me. And I'm going to pass it on to uh, John from Portland. All right, thanks for that. Um, uh, yeah, we've been really inspired by, uh, by uh, what um, other groups have done in terms of building their machines. Uh, we don't have quite as big a machine, but I'll describe sort of our, our evolution here, and hopefully that will kind of um, help people understand what their own roadmap might be. Um, going back kind of to the, you know, maybe uh, 2017 uh, uh, years when we were sort of first active, we really started out with just trying to get our feet wet in, in terms of fundraising. And so we had a variety of events, some large, some small. We had some friends who had uh, spaces that were kind of restaurant spaces that could be shut off. And we would we had a couple of big events where we got 50 to 100 people. Um, they donated their space. We brought food. We sort of uh, taught, kind of tried to educate people about what Sister District was doing. And that felt like a really great opportunity to make the case for why Sister District was so important, especially for people in Portland, where it's you know there was there was sort of a uh, blue solid area, but they were worried about uh, kind of the, the overall trends in the in the country. Um, and then we had other types of things that were house parties. We we, we experimented with raffles and types of things to try and get uh, um, uh, funding up. But I'd say most of the gifts on those were on the order of uh, fifty to hundred dollars. And at the time, you know that I, I guess if you're new, asking somebody you know a friend to give a hundred dollars can be a little bit. Um, feel a little bit intimidating for some of us and but you know we came away with some of these big events with you know maybe getting um two or three or four thousand dollars and i felt like you know okay that's decent um but some of these you know i i 
sort of, I felt like, well, we need to, to up the ante. And so we kind of uh, engaged sister district and they gave us some good uh, suggestions. And so, um, so then we tried this kind of matching approach. And, uh, and I think our first uh, attempt, we sort of had some goal we were trying to hit where, and I can't, I don't have, I, I should have kept better notes with our numbers, but as an example, we had a, um, one of the candidates from Virginia who's gonna come up. We wanted to have $10,000 in matching funds, which was sort of more than what we'd been getting before. Uh, with the idea of, well, maybe we can give other people, you know, get new people in here, they'll be more inspired to, to give more. And so, um, so for that, we, you know, so it was $10,000 in matching funds. So that was kind of my assignment was to do that. I split this with a friend. And so I, you know, I had in my mind, I need to go out and find $5,000 in matching funds. And I think, you know, my, my, my sort of the mental model I had for this was, well, you know, uh, how am I going to do this? Maybe I can find um, 10 people who give $500 or, um, five people who will give a thousand dollars, maybe that's asking. And what I found was that it went really quick. And so I think there, for certain people, there's the value proposition on this is really high. And so it didn't take 10 people giving $500 or five people giving a thousand dollars. It took like two people who gave like $2,000 and then one, you know, one more. Um, and, and they wanted to give more. And some of them, I was like, well, it's sort of, you know, it's kind of fixed at this, at this certain, uh, um, uh, uh, you can only give so much, but, but it, it went really quick. And I think what I found was like, there's certain people here who really want, who believe in this. They don't want to spend a lot of time. They actually don't want to show up for the event. They don't want to do the research. Um, I think what, what mattered to, um, to them was that the pitch was reasonable. And I think I had good support from sister district on, you know, what's the ROI and why does that matter? Um, that this was curated information from a trusted source. And I think kind of the classic example is uh, too many people gave to Mitch McConnell's uh, uh, opponent. You know, that was not money well spent. Um, they get a thousand emails a day. They don't want to pay attention to those. I'm telling them this is a good place to spend their money. Um, and then we made it easy. So, you know, they didn't have to go, they didn't have to go to invent. They didn't have to sign up for a thing. They didn't have to do whatever. They, they knew exactly where to click for a link. And if they couldn't find the link, I said, just send me a check and we'll find a way to kind of get the money for you. This was easy to, for, you know, for, for, to sort of, uh, convert that check into something where we gave it to, to, to the right, the right group, but we just worked to make it as easy as possible. Um, we, so we did a couple other, so that was sort of, and that was pretty successful. We did a couple other things where, where we, um, we had kind of uh, specific uh, wine tasting things. Some of those were virtual. Some of those we did in Portland where we had a case of wine and for people who gave some amount, we would sort of hand deliver them the wine and say hello from the porch during the COVID times. Um, and I think those were you know, also kind of another way of kind of getting people involved and getting people uh, uh, excited about this. But I think the, the, the big catch for me was really that um, there was a lot of value in the, uh, in the matching fund approach um, that it was sort of much easier to go out and have a five minute call with somebody who was willing to give that and then sort of have that build up um, uh, um, uh, funding. And I found that to be um, uh, uh, kind of psychologically easier for me than sending out a blanket email to 30, 50, 100 people asking for $50 uh, from them when maybe they would or maybe they wouldn't give. Um, so that's my kind of, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a thumbnail sketch of what we did. I have other thoughts here about some of the, you know, the, the challenges and um, things I'm thinking about for the next year, but we'll save that for the Q&A and I will pass this on to, whoops, I don't have that turn into our next speaker. Thank you. I think that's Kelly. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, I guess I just wanted to start by saying that fundraising has not been a huge focus of our group. Um, we do a really nice job with phone banking and direct action and postcarding and texting. And, um, and unlike Lisa, our initial uh, slogan was that we're not the fun group. So <laughs> I know you're going to laugh at that. Um, so thought. Um, we did a few, we've done some small um, fundraising events, um, but last year was our year to really try some new things. And, uh, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our one day blitz. And um, a blitz is a one day fundraising effort with a big social media component. Um, and so if the big day of giving is a big deal in your community, then you've seen uh, what a blitz looks like. Um, but of course, a blitz requires days of preparation and, uh, and probably years of community building uh, to make successful. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about our group. Um, we're Sister District CA3 
Um, we need to change our name because we're not going to be CA3 anymore, but we are um, in kind of a small area outside of Sacramento. We're not, so there's a sister district Sacramento group. We're outside of that. And I would not say that we are a group that has lots of deep pockets. Um, and so, um, so that's also something that we have to, to think of. Um, and so we have done small amounts of fundraising and decided last year to, uh, to try and up our game there. Um, so a background in our, our thinking and our, our event. Um, and uh, Sister District, I believe it was Madison, wrote up a really excellent case study. So um, that, that kind of summarizes all of that. Um, but we had, at the time last year, last summer, had two candidates, um, and we were planning a big online fundraiser for one of our candidates, for Fennell Norton. Um, and then it kind of occurred to us that we had a short window of time to do something for our other candidate that did not really have the people power to do a similar event. And we also didn't want to do the same event for Nancy Guy. Um, and so uh, the other thing that went into our thinking is that we had received a large for us $1,000 donation to Nancy Guy from one of our volunteers. Uh, so I called her up and said, wow, that's awesome. Can you hold off on that donation and can we fold it into a matching donation situation? Um, and then we secured another donor. So we had a total of $2,000 for a challenge grant. Um, and so that was kind of the genesis of it. And so we followed a model um, that is, you know, detailed in the case study where we did an email update to all members that this was coming and we called it um, Match Monday. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of alliteration. <laughs> and then we did a heads up to our leadership team to let them know that, you know, an important part of their job was to repost you know, to, uh, you know to, to be involved in our social media effort. We also did a heads up to like-minded community groups in our area asking for repost. Um, and in particular, um, you know, we have a strong working relationship with um, our local Indivisible group um, and also uh, Davis College Democrats and the Yellow Democratic Party and, uh, you know, Moms Demand Matt Action. Um, and then our social media, we had an initial post um, that explained it. Um, since we hadn't done it before, we needed to explain it. And then we had posts every two hours um, that highlighted one important essential part of Nancy Guy uh, and you know, actions that she had done. And then we had a final post announcing that we had raised 4,200. Um, and so these are posts that were shared by our own volunteers, by other community groups, et cetera. Um, and, you know, kind of a final thought is that we have done time consuming, um, uh, you know, events that required hours and hours of volunteer time, you know, brunches, evening receptions, coordinating with other groups. And those events do have advantages, you know, team and community building, you know, are important but they are not necessarily efficient for fundraising. And um, some of our biggest fundraisers have come during this. We also did the Fennell Norton online fundraiser that raised $8,000, which was our biggest one day event. Um, and so, um, you know, these are events that require speakers to spend some time and a communications team to spend quite a bit of time. Uh, but they are not the in the trenches making appetizers, you know, hand, you know, writing out invitations. Um, and so that's, uh, I think that's important and uh, happy to answer more questions about it um, in the future. And I think I'm going to hand it off to our next speaker, who is uh, Jim. Yeah. Um Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, um, uh, Greater Chicago, that I'm, in, I'm with the Greater Chicago team, and uh, we, we had a very successful blitz last year. We raised uh, $14,000, um, and we used the, C, I, I, the, the case study. I, I thought it was CA3's case study uh, uh, as, a, as our guide. <laughs> it was just excellent, and uh, we used that, and uh, and like Kelly said, one, we've done a lot of activities and they've been fun and good team building and made some money on them or raised some money on them. But 
really this blitz was the best ROI in terms of our investment of time and energy that we've ever had in terms of fundraising. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about fundraising blitz momentum. Uh, I'll touch on a few other topics uh, on, the, on the blitz as well, but uh, we've had many activities over the past couple of years, uh, uh, fun and informative, but we've never done a pure fundraising activity like the blitz. So we were a little uncertain about what our objective would be. Um, we had $3,500 of matching donations available, and I'll talk a little more about those. So we set the objective at $7,000, assuming we would get uh, get get those covered. Uh, we, I think we probably thought that was a bit of a stretch when we put the blitz together, um, but, uh, but that was what we started out with. Um, after what seemed like a slow start the day of the blitz, the donations started to come in. And then one particular, we got one particularly large donation from one of our wonderful volunteers and the Blitz team at that time decided, well, let's, with the donor's consent, call it a, a match. Let's say that's a part of our matching amount. And, uh, and I think that really helped move the momentum of the Blitz forward. Um, we asked some of the other donors, uh, during, some of the other people that donated during the day, if we could call their, their uh, donations matches. And they were fine with it. I mean, it was no extra money from them. And it, it, it helped the Blitz. Again, uh, uh, at some point we were up to $6,000 in matching donations. And I just really think that helped drive the momentum of the, uh, uh, of the blitz. Um, uh, I will say uh, communications uh, on the blitz as Kelly pointed out was essential, good communications and our, our communications uh, folks, uh, the people on the Blitz team that did the communications, Lauren Long, our team leader, uh, Julie Burwell, and Michelle Thomas, who did the texting, they, they did an excellent job and blanketed text, email, social media, and a lot of us leaders did a personal outreach. So uh, that we, we recovered that really well. Another important thing I, I thought that was that helped us the day of the Blitz was our internal communication among the Blitz team was really good. Um, we were in contact with each other um, and uh, uh, we had good communications the day of the Blitz on our messaging. Um, and then also we, we, we also uh, tracked the donation process progress pretty closely uh, via NAC. Um, so we did that from the beginning of the day, and that really gave us the comfort to increase the matching donations and uh, and further drive uh, the the donation moment, momentum. Um, we were fortunate; we're we're a large team, um, uh, and we're fortunate to start the year out with matching donors. I think uh, um, you know uh, John and Lisa had talked a bit about how they developed their matching donors. I think the only thing I would add is um, one source of match a good uh, one good source of matching donors for our team has been family members. Um, they, they, you know, it, we we didn't get our our progressive values and activism in a vacuum. Uh, probably came from family members. They're probably sympathetic to what we're doing. So uh, that was been a, that's been a good source of uh, matches for us. And on the day of the blitz, besides that. We had other volunteers that really stepped up with uh, matching donations. Uh, they've been active, but never really like that. And uh, then some of them really went out of their comfort comfort zone and recruited new matching donors that really hadn't been a part of the sister district. So it was a real team effort uh, to, 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 to get the, the, the donations we got in. Um, and then that, the only thing I'll say about the donation asks is, uh, I, saw, I think uh, we've seen some great examples of how to do this at the summit. Uh, Lisa Diaz Nash with uh, the, the, her, 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 her request for the recurring donations. I know it was very effective. It worked for me. Um, and then yesterday's fundraising panel was really good. Uh, Bonnie Henderson's advice of how do you get matching donations, you ask. And then the idea of 10 magic words for, uh, uh, for getting a donation, ask and thank you ask again and thank you again. I like that a lot. Uh, and that's, that's what you do. So uh, 
Uh, thanks everyone. I, I wanna wish everyone success this year in fundraising. I know fundraising isn't our main objective, but it's important and necessary for our main objective and that's to get our candidates elected. So thanks everyone. Awesome, thank you, Jim. And uh, we'll take some time now. We have about 20, 25 minutes for questions, which is really great. So if you have a question, please put your question in the chat or use the raise hand function. It's down under reactions and then raise hand. And I'll read questions for our panelists from the chat um, as or um, call on you to, to unmute and raise your hand as folks type out their questions and think of how they they want to ask those to our panelists. I have a, a first question for for Kelly and I'm going to add you back to the spotlight as well, Kelly, and add our panelists as well. Um, but Kelly, can you tell us a little bit more? You mentioned your partnership with Moms Demand Action. Can you tell us about how you developed that relationship with them and how that relationship um, you've used in, in your fundraisers? Yeah, um, you know, so especially in Virginia, there, you know, there was a lot of controversy over gun safety legislation, and we have a very active um, Moms Demand Action Group, um, and so we've reached out to them quite a bit, um, and for our Blitz, we created a image just for them, um, and Nancy Guy, I just remember her coming to one of our meetings and she had a very, very compelling story. Um, and so I'm going to show you that the, the, the image that we created for Moms Demand Action because, I mean, she literally walked past armed men to, you know, to cast these votes. And so we were able to kind of put this together and put together an image for them to share our link. And, you know, and this is kind of a moment where we don't care who gets credit. We had the link, it was our dedicated link. So we knew how many people, um, uh, you know, donated. Um, but I don't think when they put this up, I don't think that they mentioned that it was sister district. I think they just, you know, used this image that we created. And, you know, we all know that it's really hard just to come up with images and, you know, and all of that kind of thing. And so we, we did that. And we've tried to do that with some other groups. Um, our closest working relationship was with Indivisible YOLO. Um, and, uh, and we have um, a lot of our action teams for elections, um, our call team and our walk team, um, our joint teams, but with Indivisible YOLO um, so that we can um, you know, kind of connect and work together, especially in midterm years. Can I add something there too, um, uh, piggybacking on what Kelly says at some of our member meetings, I mentioned we've had speakers and we try to have speakers on issues that are related to state legislators. So we've had speakers from Planned Parenthood to talk about how reproductive rights really, uh, a lot of those bills are being passed at the state level. Um, and uh, we, we've had speakers on climate change, the same kind of thing. So we can relate to all of those different organizations where we're all on the same page um, as far as state, the importance of state legislatures and getting that message across. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, first question in the chat here is from Bill for either Kelly or for Jim. When you do a blitz, uh, what do you tell donors about where the money goes and how do you communicate that in that short time period over email or social media? Jim, do you want to start with that? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we did our blitz uh, probably a little closer to the election uh, than I think CA3 did. Um, so we knew our candidates and uh, that's that's where that's where the money went. We we talked about our candidates, the importance of holding, uh, uh, keeping Virginia blue, uh, which sadly didn't didn't work out. But uh, um, you know, I, I do think uh, our, all our efforts kept it a lot closer than it otherwise would have been. Um, so uh, that we 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 said it was for it was for our candidates. We our candidates were Alex Askew and Chris Hurst, and. Uh, um, that, that's basically what we did. And we did it. Ours was just for Nancy Guy. I'm just going to kind of in the case study, I think it has a copy of our email. You know, it just says to anonymous donors for Guy's reelection. You know, we, you know, repeated this story that we heard from her. You know, we kind of mentioned 
you know, since sister, sister district CA3 was assigned Nancy Guy as a candidate in the spring, we've learned more about of us and many of us have heard her speak. We've been moved and awed by her courage and her commitment. You know, so we did, you know, the, the essential ask um, and, you know, this went out the day before. And I don't think, um, I think Jim mentioned that, and I don't think I did, but sister district also supported us with a text um, to all of our, um, all of our uh, members, which was also helpful. Uh, and again, I want to add something that's that's sort of related, but not directly. Um, when we've had our candidates appear, um, we always ask them ahead of time uh, what the money that we're raising will go to. So, for example, um, at an event we had for Shelly Simons um, uh, a couple of years ago, um, she said, wow, it was at the beginning of her campaign. If we could raise $10,000 at that event, that would help to uh, help her to hire a field organizer early on in the campaign, um, which she ordinarily would not be able to do. And we were able to raise that $10,000. So that is really specific. She came on the screen to say that, and that really motivated people to donate. Um, thanks, Lisa. And uh, Maureen touched on this yesterday in the fundraising panel as well. But, um, you know, even if you don't get that direct message from your candidate, we highly recommend, and I can drop it in the chat, the fundraising donation menu from the Sister District Resource Library that, you know, outlines what a donation might um, allow a campaign to buy, like a field organizer, as Lisa mentioned, or, you know, a $50 donation might buy yard signs or digital ad buy, and helping um, make those donation acts a little bit more concrete so that donors can really visualize where their money is going. Um, we're going to take a break from the chat and go to Jim Banner. I see your hand raised there, Jim. Um, Yvonne, I see you too, so we'll, we'll hit you next. So Jim, if you want to unmute and ask your question. You might not be able to unmute in. Hold on, Jim. Give me one sec. Am I, am I unmuted? There you go. Yes, hi. Hello, everyone. Um, Jim, nice to see you. My question is, because I'm impressed, um, what is the infrastructure that is necessary to do all this? Namely, how many people do you, Jim, and Kelly and Lisa have working on average at any particular time during a campaign season on raising money? Um, I, I'll start off. Um, we, we have we have three people that are really responsible for fundraising on our team. Um, and, and I'm one of them. Um, but for the blitz in particular, um, we, we had seven people working on it. Uh, that was really the blitz team and a couple people helped out otherwise, but, uh, three, of, I mentioned the three folks that did the communications that was important. Um, and then, um, and then other people with just, you know, motivating volunteers to find match, matching donors and, and find donors and help get the message out. And then, then quite honestly, um, we, we have a fairly large leadership team in Chicago. We, we started out with a lot of little teams that we combined into one uh, in 2020. So we have a pretty good sized leadership team and it's pretty active and uh, they were all involved in personal outreach on the Blitz, Blitz, but the infrastructure for the Blitz for us was basically seven, seven, say seven and a half people. And we had, um, I mean, really it was probably four people who were on our communications team. So this, the Blitz was really a, a function of the, our communications team. And we were really lucky that we had an excellent graphic designer all last year and uh, who volunteered our time and we've lost her. So we're, we're hurting with that. Um, and we don't have a fundraising team per se. Our communications team does some of it. Um, and we have relied in the past mostly on partnerships. There's a local fundraising group that connected with us a couple times. Um, we have a new research team that is starting um, a letter that's, you know, we got an idea from a summit a couple of years ago uh, to do giving circles, and we're starting that this month. And, um, and I guess I just wanted to say that I would say fundraising is probably 
I personally, as an organizer, have had to grow the most, you know, that a lot of other things I was pretty familiar with. Um, and I personally have really appreciated the scripts, the advice, the case studies from sister districts. Since I'm not an expert, this, you know, wasn't my professional expertise. I just follow them to the letter. I'm sure later on I will be able to deviate and, you know, add my own spin to it. But, um, for example, for making an ask, I look at the video, I copied the video, I added my stuff and it worked. And so I think that's one play, that's one area where I really appreciate the sister district infrastructure. Um, because when you don't know what you're doing, it's really nice to be able to talk to people who do. And at uh, CA Peninsula, we have a very strong leadership team of 17. We have one fundraising chair, but we all pitch in and we have uh, two people on email communication and uh, one now hopefully soon to be two people on social media. Um, we did try a little texting within our chapter. We didn't find that that was particularly effective. So we kind of abandoned that. Um, but we're sending out emails um, three, sometimes four times a week um, to our chapter, multiple emails for events. Um, and then we have a strong base of volunteers when we have in-person events uh, to check people in and uh, help with all the things, whether it's around food and alcohol and so forth. So it takes a village to get things off the ground. Thank you all very much. Um, Yvonne, did you have a question? Let me ask to unmute. You should be able to click that unmute. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> We're neighbors, so to speak, huh? Um, I have a question about your partnership with Indivisible because one of the Indivisible people, Sacramento, does come to our meetings and vice versa. But we don't seem, from what I think, we don't have much interaction between the groups. So how did you cultivate that? Did, well, I mean, our origin story is that, you know, there was a group of us who started, of strangers, who started meeting after the Trump election. And uh, we thought we were going to form our own group. And instead, we all spun out. One person became indivisible leader. One person became sister district leader. One person, you know, did another thing. So, so it's unusual in that we all started as organizers together. And that was brand new to all of us. <laughs> um, you know, I might have had the most political experience at the time, um, but it was, you know, decades in the past. And so that's a little unusual. Um, and I think that it's a me for us, it's a mutually beneficial thing because Indivisible Yellow has many other things they do in addition to um, electoral work. And so for us, we can kind of keep the electoral work going year after year, and then they can kind of come in um, in the midterms. And so I think there's some help. It, you know, there's some downsides. It's, a, you know, for some of our volunteers, it's confusing who's who and who's doing what. Um, but we, you know, always have been trying to put the work uh, first. And, um, but that's, you know, I'm sure there's other groups in the community. Moms Demand Action, they've been a little yeah. bit more standoffish because they have a little bit more of it. They have a nonpartisan stance. Yeah. Um, but we have really tried this year, this past year to develop partnerships. And for example, with our local League of Women Voters, absolutely nonpartisan, we're doing a joint um, voter registration, knock every door action in a rural, largely Latino community. And so that's, you know, that's a little bit of local training for our volunteers um, and, uh, and also some community building and, you know, and some publicity, but it's, you know, it is challenging. So when, it, when you look at your donations that you raised in the Blitz, were they from sister district people or did they also come from Moms Demand Action and Indivisible? Other yeah. Groups? I don't, you know what, that would have been great for me to do that. I didn't, I, you know, I'm always surprised at the random people you get. And Jim, you might have that feeling too. Like every once in a while, you'll be like, 
where did that $500 come from? I've never heard of that person. They live in Michigan. How did they hear about us? And so that's, you know, that's the beauty of online fundraisers is that there's, um, you know, there's just some randomness. And, and I think the last thing I'm going to say, I'm sorry, is that, you know, fundraising is tough for a lot of us. The ask is tough for a lot of us. But the one thing that I would say that I have learned is that there are so many people out there who have money and want to know where to put it. And they are, somebody alluded to this, they're putting them in ridiculous places. They're, you know, I just was at a meeting last night where people were talking about who was running against Marjorie Taylor Greene. It was a big progressive. And I'm like, yeah, that person's not going to win. <laughs> and, you know, and the Amy McGraths and, you know, and so there's people who, um, who, who have a huge heart and progressive leanings and literally don't know how to be strategic with their donations. And so I okay. feel like we're doing a service. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 Kelly, I, I think uh, I agree. Um, as far as on our blitz, the donors came from all over, and I, I attribute that. I, I, I know we don't have a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, relationships with some of the other groups that uh, that it sounds like you guys do. But uh, on the blitz, we got donations from people that just, you know, I, I keep track of it and try to, you know, I, I, I try to measure and do let our team know how we're doing on fund tra- on fundraising. And there were just people that were coming out of the woodwork on that thing. And I attribute it to our leaders, our other leaders, just stretching themselves and the personal outreach on the Blitz. And uh, um, the, 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 I, I w- again, I was really impressed by the, the recruitment of new matching donors that we got for the Blitz. So, uh, uh, I, I, and I, I, I think, and I was really close to the election um, and, uh, I think, uh, well, w- w- let me just say, we, we definitely w- will be, fo- have been, and will be following up with some of those, uh, some of those new, new faces that showed up on the, on the blitz data. Awesome. And Maureen, I see you have your hand raised. So we'll take the next question for Maureen. Um, so actually I just wanted to a respond to something that Yvonne and that you were talking about, Kelly, about local groups. So we have a very, we have a local indivisible group here. And, uh, and uh, I <clears throat> went, started a year ago, they meet weekly for two to two and a half hours. Mm-hmm. So I as- attended all their meetings last year and provided, um, th- we agreed, I could have two minutes, two slides, two minutes to advertise sister district. They're hyper-focused on local issues. And they were really clear at the beginning that they were not going to be providing volunteers or anything, but they're very progressive. But in the end, in the end, after a year's worth of leaning in, we got several thousand dollars from them. We had several of them attend our events. And one of them actually came up to me and said, I finally understand the importance of state legislatures and (laughs) candidates. So it was, I don't know what it cost per hour of my time, but it was well worth it. And I think sometimes um, when we've reached out to other groups, we have to remember what can we bring to the group? What can we do for them? And instead of always like, when you come to our event, you do this, you do that. Like, this is what we can do for you and expand your horizons and, uh, you know, advertise in our partner section of our memo, like, you know, their upcoming events, as long as they don't conflict with our candidates or our events. And I'll just add that I am an indivisible dropout. Um, (laughs) One of our uh, co-captains came to an indivisible meeting that I attended early on in 2017 and and talked about sister district. And I said, wow, that's where I want to spend my energy. And so going to that indivisible meeting caused me to migrate over to sister district. So you may get some more volunteers that way by doing outreach. Awesome, thanks Lisa. Um, Terry, I see your question in the chat about um, the DLCC matching grants and I wish I had a better answer for you. The DLCC has been an awesome partner with us um, as a national phone bank partner and coming to phone banks and getting folks to our phone banks. 
I don't know of any matching donations that we've done with the DLCC in the past um, because they have their, their direct connections to the candidates already as the, the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee. Um, and we've been really uh, focused on our partnership with them and recruiting the folks on their list to join us for phone banking efforts for, for candidates instead. Um, John, I see your hand raised. So I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute there. I just wanted to mainly shout out to Lisa Rosenthal and the uh, Peninsula group. I think it was 2018, I'm a professional musician. My band got hired to go to a, a house party event on the, on the Peninsula. The, the hostess, his name was Darcy. I remember that because there's a song I like about Darcy Farrow. <laughs> and we played a, a fun first set and then a political meeting broke out. And some of the other guys were like taking a walk outside. I was enthralled. And when I left, I donated the money I'd made for the concert and I joined San Francisco one because I didn't want to drive down to the peninsula, but <laughs> that was such an inspiring meeting that started my interest in sister district. So thank you very much. Good to hear. Good to hear. Thank you. And thanks for your donation. We have just a few minutes left, so if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or throw it in the chat. I actually have a, a question for John. You mentioned um, during your presentation some of the challenges that you faced, and um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what those challenges you thought were going to, like, you thought those challenges were going to be and how you overcame those this year when you were um, asking matching donors specifically for money. Yeah, I think some of them, I think we're still figuring out how to overcome them. Um, I think um, uh, I'll mention one that's technical and then one that's, uh, um, I think is we're sort of seeing a way there and, and kind of maybe that let that lead into what I'm thinking for the next year. So I think one is um, we didn't, we, we don't have, we didn't have a clean system for um, uh, uh, once you get kind of a commitment for matching donations to you know, tracking where that goes and how that gets uh, donated. So it's not like you can, they can say, yeah, I want to commit. And you can say, okay, click on this link or send me the money or whatever. So, you know, it's sort of like, there's a little bit of an honor system you can do through Google Doc, but but I think I'd like to have something, you know, if the list gets bigger to be able to track that a little bit easier. Um, I think the other one that, you know, we're, that, that many of us uh, 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 think about and struggle about is kind of going back to the well too many times, the same people. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people who are into this kind of give and we'd like to have a bigger circle. And that's one nice thing about the matching funds is you get kind of, you know, the, 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 the people you can count on to give and then hopefully use that to attract new people. Um, the, I think there's, uh, I've been um, to a couple of meetings by a group called uh, Volunteer Donor Associates. I think BDA, I think is, is that's what it is. And, and they're here to help people like us who are trying to give, um, uh, to, to get donors to give money where we're, you know, we're not paid, we're volunteers on this process. And, um, and they have a couple of, you know, uh, exercises or suggestions for broadening your list and, and building out the list. And, and I'm working through that. But I think my, you know, I guess the, the one message I want to um, offer or suggest to the team is, you know, I think every year um, we've done this, you know, the, the limit to what we've raised has been set not by what we've asked for, but kind of what we said internally. And I think, you um, I guess I just, I, you know, I want to go big. And so when we, when we said, let's, you know, let's sort of see if we can raise $10,000 in matching funds and then get another $10,000. We did that. So it was really fun. I think last year we raised something like $30,000. There's groups out there that raise uh, much more, a million dollars, um, $500,000. There's no reason that we can't do the same. I think this is just sort of being ambitious, thinking about how you do that and getting the value proposition, right. This is a, this is really, I think the right place to, to, to put money. And I think, um, if you're a trusted resource, there's people out there with uh, who want to give to that. They don't want to spend a lot of time giving to things that don't matter. Um, and I think just setting those goals high uh, and really going for it, it's more fun to raise $500,000 than $30,000. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. And I think that's a really great note to end on because it, it echoes a lot of the what our panelists have said over the course of this weekend, not just today, that you know one of the best ways to raise money is to simply ask. And you can never, um, you don't know if you're going to raise money if you don't ask folks and you, you never know who's going to come out of the woodwork or who has more to give. And, and the worst thing that folks can say is no. And it's, Bonnie said this yesterday, but usually it's in an extraordinarily nice way. And they're just like, I can't right now. And so um, thank you all for, for joining the fundraising panel. We've taken some notes in the agenda and we'll 
send the agenda around after it has the contact information for the four amazing leaders that you heard from here. And, and I'm sure they'd all um, be happy to, to talk with you all one-on-one -on -one about those fundraising tactics as well. And with that, I will um, pass it back to Lala, I believe. No? That's okay. Good.